Hi, I'm Lady Tehila from the Covenant of the Open Mind, and you're watching Wicca and Witchcraft 101. Hail and welcome. This week we're talking about, this is lecture eight, and we're talking about astrology. Uh, I am going to try to cover all of astrology in the sense that it's everything that you need to know in order to understand astrology's place within Wicca and how to use it in witchcraft and how to make use of it for yourself. Um, it's not like fully complete. I'm not going to have time to give you any examples of doing natal charts. I will link you to our other course. We have a whole course on astrology on our website. So uh, today we're just going to talk about astrology within Wicca. Uh, why is it useful and, and when will you hear people use it and that sort of thing? What do you need to know in order to be Wiccan, whether or not you care about astrology personally? <laughs> you will hear Wiccans talk about astrology. Um, a lot of Wiccans do believe in it and, um, and make use of it in their practices. Uh, so this will explain that. Uh, then we'll talk a bit about the zodiac signs. A lot of this information was pulled directly from the astrology slide. So for those of you who have already done that course people online on YouTube um, you're gonna see some of the same information again I'm gonna breeze through it here so hopefully it's just high level uh, we're gonna talk about the planets the houses aspects which is the relationship between the planets We'll talk about what the Aquarian age is. You'll see Wiccans often will talk about oh it's the end of the age of Pisces and the beginning of a new age. It is. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, and why are they talking about it? And then I will also talk about why you would draw a natal chart and how you do it and give you some tools that help you learn how to do it. Um, and that will um, get us to <laughs> talking about the exercises because that's one of the exercises for this chapter. Astrology in Wicca has many, many, many applications. It's used by a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. People have different beliefs about what the signs mean, what dates you're supposed to use, and all sorts of things. Um, many will keep track of when the planets are going to transition from one sign to the next uh, in a calendar or day book. Um, people will use astrology to determine things like when they should do a certain kind of spell, when they should harvest a certain kind of herb, when they should craft or use a certain kind of tool, uh, when you could do enchanting uh, the best, uh, when spell work is most effective. So we've talked about looking at the moon phase and how that influences your spell work, the waxing, full, and waning. Well, there is a cardinality involved in astrology and we're going to see how that waxing full and waning plays out but if you think back to the previous lecture where we talked about um, the how to derive the uh, meaning of the zodiac signs uh, and, and the theory behind it so that's in the previous lecture we're not going to go over that again here but if you think back to that you remember that each of the four quadrants is ruled by a sign so that'll be the fixed energy so we're going to see this same cardinality uh, in these in astrology as well and it's all derived in the same way it's worth it to know that other ways that we use astrology within wicca you're going to see um, people will use it for divination you could uh, look at the stars um, based on the date and time of the question and when you thought of it and then use that as a way of being like okay this came to my mind at this time for some reason right so maybe i can gain some understanding of that reason if I look at where the stars are located, see what else is going on in the world at that time. <laughs> and uh, you can also use it as a form of divination um, when you've seen something or had a vision or you've predicted something using tarot cards or rune stones or by scrying. And you're now you're just saying, okay, when is it likely to happen? Uh, maybe you use those tools to get you a number and you're like, okay, two. <laughs> two what? What's the units? So then you may turn to astrology and say, okay, well, what's the energy going to be like? What's going on in the world? Uh, maybe that'll help me figure out if it's two weeks, two days, <laughs> two months, two years. Uh, and so that's another time when you would look at the stars, uh, when you want to predict when something might come to pass. Uh, you may also use astrology as a form of protection because 
world events are happening that are influenced by astrology in in part you know it, it governs that which you cannot control in a sense it's a window into the type of energy that will influence things the types of things that will happen will uh, have a certain sort of action to them a certain way that they come about and that is what astrology predicts the the actual just energy itself not the particulars which is still very much embedded in free will. So you can't use any of these divination tools that we're going to talk about, astrology in this one and the rest of them uh, in the next chapter. <laughs> and you can't use any divination tools to get lottery numbers. <laughs> it's not how it works. <laughs> um, the future is something that is not set in stone. It's not determined, right? It's probabilistic. So all you can do is really know the rough, like this is what this influence usually is like. Right. Because we have characterized the motion of all of these planets and the motion of all the places that they could be found on this orbit. Uh, so that helps us to understand what the influence from the stars will be like. And that gives us some window into what we can expect, because a lot of people are very influenced by astrology. Like we said, go ask any nurse about ERs on a full moon. <laughs> it matters. It has an effect on us how the planets and these things are moving around. So we're going to talk about what that effect is. Uh, many people will also use astrology as a way to know themselves, to bring alignment between the spiritual self and the divine self. Um, and that's done by the, the natal chart, the birth chart. So based on what time and date uh, and location that you were born in. And we'll talk about that at the end. So um, just a little hint of metaphysics, because <laughs> it's me. You wouldn't come to me if you didn't want a little hint of metaphysics. <laughs> okay, so the gravitational waves, uh, that is the metaphysical basis for astrology. It's not the same thing as gravity. Gravity is the force of attraction. It is the fact that two things, if left alone in a space, will want to be with each other <laughs> and not apart. And that is just a universal truth uh, in our love lives. <laughs> I'm speaking to you directly with that comment, Starfire, uh, and you're probably listening, daughter. But uh, And also in reality, things attract. And they sometimes collide and, and get bumped into by other things. And it's not a perfect, you know, it, it causes wobbles okay it causes gravitational waves it causes tiny little oscillations in the fabric of space-time and that's because like we talked about in past lectures if you are interested in the metaphysics and you're following along with the metaphysics you remember that we said that gravity shapes the stage on which it occurs it actively changes the shape of the fabric of space-time, right? So if space-time is some like field of some kind, then gravity happening within it causes it to look different, to behave different, to, you know, so it's a very complex system. When we are in a very large many-body system, now it's not technically a many-body system in the sense that uh, most of the bodies are significantly less massive than the sun, right? So, um, but it's got a lot of massive objects orbiting a large massive object <laughs> and when they move around the sun you know there's an equal but opposite force right the sun pulls at them and that's what keeps it in in the orbit but the planet also tugs on the sun and so the sun is thought of as being this static object at the center of the solar system that doesn't move and everything moves around it but in reality as everything moves around it it wobbles around because it's getting tugged in lots of directions. And that wobble generates gravitational waves. That is theoretical science, but it's pretty well established. We can measure the gravitational waves from large explosions like supernovae and stuff, but uh, the instrumentation is not evolved enough or something. The, the waves coming from the effect of our sun are so, so small, we wouldn't be able to measure them. And that's why it's like they would have they could, why wouldn't they have an effect on us since we're made of space-time, first of all? Um, 
they go through everything, right? You don't even notice them. They're like neutrinos or whatever, things that pass through matter and you don't notice them. Um, but why, but, but like we are made of fields and we are complex, uh, you know, objects ourselves, right? So why would the changing nature of the fabric that makes us up not have an impact on us? That I can't make sense of that, that people are so slow to accept that this would impact us, I don't fully understand. But how would it impact us is not something that we can address scientifically. We don't really know how the body works on its smallest levels. We struggle to understand the neurotransmitter level, the chemical component of the electrical process that is our thoughts, and we don't understand, okay? They don't understand me, guys. <laughs> Whatever. But only anthropological, and uh, only anthropologically have we characterized the influence on us, which means that we have observed the influence. We have just observed it over many thousands of years across many different peoples and witches um, appropriate everything or appreciate whatever way you look at it. <laughs> and they have studied all the systems. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the one that they think is the amalgamation, the summation, the one that works the best. It's derived from the elements. It's got a theory behind it, which is love that kind of thing. They love ordered, very highly ordered uh, processes and things. So that's where we are here. So the planets all revolve at different rates and they produce an incredible fractal pattern. And it's intricate. Uh, it's complex. And it's honestly, it's far too detailed to easily be analyzed, like in a mathematical way, like in a rigorous way. And so um, astrology is really an analogy for what's going on here. It's a simplification of a very complex calculation that uses storytelling and mythology and things that people can relate to <laughs> in order to um, uh, explain what's really going on and allow you to have a relationship with it and know, okay, is this me or is it just the stars? Because <laughs> sometimes it really is just the stars. Like everyone's been having nightmares lately. That's the stars. Dreams are about to turn around and become vivid prophetic dreams for a time. And then once we cross into Lilith, it'll let up. All of that I can say to you because of the astrology. <laughs> so we inherit these terms and symbols that are based around, you know, different deities and different things. And they all have an archetypal energy of order, right? So that is the important thing to remember, that they named it Mercury because Mercury as an idea, as a concept, as a component, an archetype of order is the essence of what that planet governs within us. So we're going to go through and talk about that. But first, first, I would like to talk about the Zodiac as a whole and give you a metaphor, <laughs> a metaphor of a metaphor. Honestly, it's like just but that's all astrology is. And I want you to think about the Zodiac as being a, a lifelong journey. It's the story of a life. <laughs> and that is where it comes from. It starts over here on the leftmost side with the bright red one and it goes counterclockwise. And that's because it's reflecting the motion of the stars uh, on a two dimensional sphere. So if the planet is rotating that way, then the stars are moving around. So it's just like the flat wheel. That's what they call it. And I'll give you a copy of the flat wheel because you're going to need it. And in this metaphor, think of every house is the stage, every planet is the actor, and every zodiac sign is the costume that actor is wearing. So you're going to want to just think about it like there's a play, there's a story going on, and the story is going to capture the themes of a life, of a journey. It starts with birth, youthful dependence, youthful dependence like a child on a mother or father, the impulse to go, to do, to learn, to be, to create. That is Aries, right? House number one, governed by Aries, governs conception of the self, right? So the foundation of who you are is what that house means. So it's ruled by Aries. Aries is a sign that governs true expression. 
Okay, so you'll see there's these themes of the first house is governed by Aries and they all have similar energy, right? So that's how it works. That's how you should think about it as we go through it. It's a lot to remember, so don't try to remember it. <laughs> I open up and look at my own slides constantly. I don't remember anything. The first thing I do when I read a chart is just go and write verbatim the words that are in my books of shadow under these different, like I just go to the slide and write it all down and then look back at the chart once I have the information in front of me. <laughs> like just listen and make a form a positive relationship with the subject and you'll learn it over time it's a really big rabbit hole to just jump down so <laughs> bear with me okay so you go from Aries into Taurus you go from that birth into first growth the start of puberty uh, they're not a baby anymore they're they're now now they're a child or um, they they feel more like they should have some responsibility and they want to be able to do things on their own then they get into that 14-year-old wisdom phase, which all of my parents know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and then they move into proper teenagehood and the puberty end stage, uh, which can get ugly, <laughs> uh, depending on how the 14-year-old wisdom stage went, I guess. <laughs> um, and that's the energy of cancer, right? Cancer is intense feelings, moodiness, back and forth, just kind of uh, that sort of um, fiery, watery relationship. Okay, that's, that's that energy. So you can see where you derive all of this from. It's all one. And that's why you get this metaphor of it being like a life, like a, a story of maturation, a coming of age story that goes beyond the early phases. Once you're in adulthood here, early adulthood, you get Leo, youthful independence, you're expressing your independence, living on your own. Then you're in Virgo, you're going to college, you're seeking truth. Libra, you're finding harmony in yourself and the world around you. Scorpio, you're mastering life. And Scorpio and Ophicus share a house. So you're shedding fears, you're adventuring, you're learning, you're seeing the world, you're mastering life, right? That's both of them together, different sides of it. You get to Sagittarius and you're seeking like minds. You're shooting out arrows to see where they land and hoping that it forms a bonfire wherever it lands and people come to gather around. You get to Capricorn, oh, that should be a lighter green probably, but you get to Capricorn and you see the manifestation of goals, uh, ambition, you start to think about your legacy, your impact, that's the Aquarius, down into Pisces where we have the timeless component, death, rebirth, and your spirituality, you know, what, what is real, what is the most real, what is the purpose of, of it all, and then you're reborn, right, so you get this cycle, and the cycle of our lives as above, so below, right? So it's just an analogy for life experience because that is what astrology governs, life experience. It affects how we experience life. <laughs> so that's the idea. It's very basic. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to step through each of these signs uh, quickly. <laughs> I'm going to try to spend one minute on every single one of them because otherwise we're going to be here all evening. I have a whole course on this. I will put that in the um, top of the video <laughs> to go watch. Whatever. Okay. Aries is the first sign, like we said. Uh, the solar month, the actual official dates are given here. I will show you where that is. That is the second line here. Um, I'm not going to call them out for all of them. They just go from the 21st to the 20th or the 21st to the 22nd or whatever. They are slightly different, but um, that's the conventional dates that you would go by, um, but they only describe where the planets were located 3,000 years ago in one particular part of the world, so it's not the most accurate thing. Um, it was really written down so you could determine the solar month, which we'll talk about in a minute after we get through the zodiac signs, what that means. And we took it to be where you should find the sun sign and all of these other things, which is not, um, which is not good. You should look at the sky. <laughs> you should know where the planets are in the actual sky. <laughs> if you're not doing that, you're not doing astrology correctly. So just so you know. <laughs> okay. So Aries aligns with the head and the body. And you can also think about it like it's an actual person, right? So they take that metaphor of it's a person all the way. If a person has a lot of stuff in Aries, they tend to be the kind of person who gets migraines or headaches, right? They, it describes also the nature of your physical body, 
where your planets wind up and the types of ailments you'll have. So like Pisces is the feet, right? Because it goes all the way around. I've got psoriasis on my feet and I've got a lot of Pisces influence in my chart. So it's just like perfectly matched up in my case in all in all the ways. But you know, that's the kind of thing that you might find. So you'll see here in each of them, there's a ruling planet. Okay, that's the similar energy, right? So Mars is that um, productivity, innovation, creation, fighting, explosive energy, uh, impulse to act. Okay, it's the earth, uh, the fire of earth. So it's lava building up inside of a mountain that goes explode, right? So ruled by Mars makes complete sense. Lines of the head and body, you're going to see this for all of them. They all have a sign or a symbol. Uh, you'll see this is the symbol here. So there's like a whole language involved. <laughs> you got to learn these symbols if you want to be able to short write, write it in your book. Um, and it's, uh, yeah. So you can read all these keywords. I'm not going to sit here and read them out. Um, there's pros, there's cons to each of these. And there's also a key challenge. So I will read that one. The, the challenge for the Aries people who have a lot of Aries energy will be of growth and learning, specifically we're learning restraint usually. So Aries is aggressive in a simple sense. Uh, it is an immature sign. It represents not like a complex planning process and high level strategy. We're talking a child that says, I have to go to the bathroom. And you say, OK, um, two minutes and we'll go. And then he just pees himself. <laughs> He's like, well, I told you I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> that's it. Uh, no, sorry. No, uh, you know, that's just it's your fault because I told you I had to go and you didn't help me. So <laughs> that's the Aries energy. Um, it represents the head. It's the simplest. It's the most most youthful. It's the least evolved part of us is the metaphor that they gave that they taught me when I took this class formally. And it has uh, had the least amount of time to develop is the idea. <laughs> so that's Aries. Taurus is the bull. Uh, Taurus is, uh, despite uh, being a masculine symbol, is very feminine. So actually a lot of people will use Taurus as a sign uh, for, um, you know, like transgenderism or that sort of thing, that it's a natural thing because it's the mother sign, the earth spirit, uh, always aligned with female energy, but it's this bull image. Um, so, you know, that's something that many people will be like, look, people have always had this where they've cross identified with masculine infant. So Taurus is this sign that has a very good blend of masculine and feminine where it's like feminine expressing, but it's also very aggressive and it feels masculine as well. It's ruled by Venus, right? So Venus is like Aphrodite. It's like the goddess of beauty and song and is very feminine. So it's this very bizarre sign. It aligns with the throat. Um, so it's a representation of expression. So that's another reason to believe that um, some people will look at this sign in the second house, in the third house a little bit, when it comes to like issues of identity. So that's why I'm, I mention it. Um, and uh, it happens, it's a spring, uh, summer um, sign as well. It just goes around the year. And Taurus, really the energy is what you see is what you get. What you see is what you get period. <laughs> that's it. No negotiation. Take it or leave it. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, and that's Taurus. Okay. Gemini. Gemini are the twins and, uh, it's a summer sign. Mercury aligns with it. Mercury is, uh, the planet of travel communication. He was a God who like flew to bring messages to people. Uh, and, um, Gemini's are very flighty, right? So they've got, uh, wings on their shoes. They really do though. <laughs> uh, they turn on a dime. Um, they can see and assimilate information very quickly, but usually it's very shallow. It's a very shallow understanding. They're not good at teaching. Um, Geminis are very quick to misinterpret things. They're very quick to think that they have all the facts, even when they don't, because they have very twisted thought processes, not twisted like perverted, twisted like... Um, convoluted where they're just like it's not clear how they go from point a to point d did they stop at a b and a c or did they just skip them because they thought they were unnecessary don't ask a gemini to tell you which <laughs> and their challenge is uh of curiosity right to be curious but not too curious um to remember that they don't know everything <laughs> and that they need to they can't figure everything out for themselves a uh, philosophy is not enough Sometimes it's you can't just sit around being abstract. Sometimes you have to know how something physically works. 
right? You have to do proper research. Geminis are bad at that. <laughs> they like to just make up their own explanations for things. They're very creative uh, because it's in the first quadrant. So it still has that waxing energy, even though it's a mutable sign, even though it's a, um, a waning sign, it's mutable. It's in the waxing quadrant. So it's like got this weird blend, right? Okay, Cancer. Cancer is the crab. It's another summer one. Uh, cancer aligns with the breast and the stomach. Um, it is ruled by the moon. Um, it uh, represents shallow water, um, the very first drops of water in a rainstorm that uh, cut the heat of the day, right? That refreshing vibe. Um, cancer is life-giving, uh, straightforward. It's comforting. Um, it's cardinal energy but they're fiery. They're in the fire quadrant, okay? They'll turn cold and shut down uh, and the minute that you cut them down. They can't handle a lot of criticism. Um, they need to feel the love first. <laughs> they uh, also never apologize because they are themselves so caught up in the emotions and the damage they cause and often very empathic so they'll feel very bad that they did something and refuse to apologize for it <laughs> they'll make amends often before they've said thank you or apologized um they'll just like you know try to make it even or something like that um and just like the moon they have many phases and they're very moody right so they go in and out of changing phases uh and they can be shut down quickly they also are very reactive they have a lot of feelings <laughs> um and they have to feel secure in order to be happy and give trust so they tend to have like very small knit people and actually the fourth house is the one that governs family so that makes sense leo is the lion uh and uh, another sun sign this one takes us into Laknasa so it's kind of starting to feel that waning energy it's a fixed sign um, so it really represents just like the height of summer and its ruling planet is the Sun so that makes perfect sense <laughs> that makes perfect sense and it's a savage um, but righteous kind of willpower just being brash and bold um, being out there and in your face uh, courage, being very courageous. And um, Leos struggle to stay out of the spotlight, even if they try. <laughs> so if your friend is a Leo, uh, or your child, <laughs> our daughter is, <laughs> uh, and you're just like, oh my god, why are they always the center of attention and they need constant attention? That's you can't blame them for their stars. <laughs> but, um, you know, Leos are likely to get burnt out. They're usually extroverted, but sometimes they can be exhausted from all the attention. Um, so a lot of times they like to have smaller knit families or they like to have time to disengage uh, or they start to become like doubtful or judgmental like of themselves. Sometimes they could be um, uh, interfering or patronizing. Sometimes they are like um, just trying to make people happy and be likable, but they're going about it in a way that people feel like is overstepping. Um, so that's Leo as well. They're very expressive and creative, and Leo is a good sign for leaders as well, so it's worth calling that out. And they have a challenge of shining positively, because it's very easy when you're the center of attention to let that attention go to your head, right? So for Leos, they have that responsibility to be good leaders, to be good influences, because the spotlight is on them so often. Virgo um, is um, the virgin, <laughs> the, the woman, the two-faced woman is how I know her, which is why I really like this icon. Um, and Virgo uh, aligns with the GI tract and is also ruled by Mercury. Um, and Virgo is a sign um, of order, and organization, most of all. Um, but it's also got this theme of like duality, like where you have confidence and also shyness. So Virgos like are secretly judging themselves all the time, but they can't help but speak out anyway, even when they feel self-conscious um, because they know the truth, right? Like they're like, I know, I know what to do. 
<laughs> I know the truth. I have to say something. Um, they often come across as harsh, judgmental, often just because people don't like the truth. <laughs> but uh, but they can be like perfectionist and uh, and overly worried and fussy. And um, they can be harsh uh, because they know they perceive of things in ways other people don't. And that gives them a power, uh, you know, over people. So they can be manipulative as well. Um, and they have a challenge to be unbiased. So often people that have a lot of Virgo influence struggle with bias and they feel like um, my way is the best way <laughs> and they look down on the people around them. But, you know, it, it depends on where all your planets are. Lo there's people with a lot of Virgo energy that are not like that. So it really depends on everything else. <laughs> there's so much stuff. Libra. Libra is a fall sign. So Virgo is the first of the fall signs and Libra is the second. Um, and it's the scales, right? So it represents balance and harmony. And its ruling planet is Venus once again. And they have the challenge of finding balance, often not just for themselves. When you get to the signs that are in the top half of the circle, um, those ones usually govern more uh, people that have a lot of signs in the bottom half of the circle tend to be living more for themselves and learning their own lessons and figuring themselves out. And people that have signs in the top uh, half of the circle are often here to be of service to others and to help them do the same. So um, Libra is the first one in that top half, right? So that's why you do sometimes find people who are um, really here to help others and mediate between others and you see a lot of service and a lot of people who have Libra go into service and be good at mediating and, and just understanding relationships and that sort of thing and that house the seventh house governs relationships so that makes sense and um, Libras are particular about the way that the world moves um, they like refinement and beauty <laughs> um, they're very capable of finding beauty in all things um, and they tend to find the rationality in the irrational like they're very open-minded and they can just see into the minds of others and understand what it is they're really thinking they also have like the ability to architect beauty and they're very kind of non-confrontational and very likely to like keep the peace that doesn't mean they're not assertive it just means that they're very polite and they have like good manners if they are assertive usually uh, it depends on all the other stars. Okay, Scorpio. Uh, Scorpio is um, another fall sign, and it's ruled by Pluto. Uh, it used to be ruled by Mars a long time ago, so you'll still see that sometimes. When they found the outer planets, they used Pluto instead. And Pluto probably makes more sense. Scorpio aligns with, um, the, like, the open ocean uh, and just big, primordial water and uh, people who are Scorpios are very forceful and determined uh, they're winners okay they don't lose <laughs> if they lose it's like catastrophic failure they're very emotional they're very emotionally driven but they're not very easily influenced by the people around them and their emotions are usually so strong that they wind up influencing the people around them so they have a challenge of involvement they have a challenge of how do I be involved without just domineering everything and making it about me? That's the Scorpio challenge. So um, that's something to keep in mind. Also, there's kind of like a lot of pressure, um, just always feeling like you have something to prove, um, like you have to win, and that's like a, a, a definition of you. People who are Scorpios tend to be very magnetic and interesting and mesmerizing and People get very taken by them. Sagittarius is the next one. Uh, Sagittarius is the archer. And um, they mean, in this case, how an archer can shoot arrows and illuminate at a distance, how an archer has a level of accessibility that other people um, don't have. And its ruling planet is Jupiter. Those who are have a lot of Sagittarius influence, they tend to be really just happy with life, <laughs> which, which drives them to not have a lot of new experiences and to seek things that are really just comforting. They like to meet people most of the time, depends on the rest of the chart, but, um, you know, they like to network and get information. They like to feel informed, uh, but they don't actually like 
to go places and do things. So you find a lot of people who have Sagittarius influence are memers and live online a lot. <laughs> and um, it's kind of like an active energy for the water quadrant. It's very fiery. And um, it's a more mature kind of fire. Okay, so Capricorn. Capricorn is um, Cardinal Earth. The sea goat, uh, it aligns with the knees, and the ruling planet is Saturn. Um, Capricorn uh, is like a swimming goat. Think of it. It can dive down to the depths of the ocean or scale the greatest heights of the mountains. It's a sea goat. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, its natural direction is, uh, is to move towards building foundations. Uh, it's safer uh, to sit still, right? So they can be kind of stubborn. Um, but once they try something new and realize that it's not so bad and that they can handle it, then they're inclined to pick that new thing up very quickly. Um, the, it's a path that involves commitment. Um, it also involves taking baby steps. Um, so if Capricorns can learn how to take everything one step at a time, uh, then they tend to be some of the most productive and competent of all, a very committed, dedicated type workers. Um, often very ambitious. So you see a lot of people that make it to the top uh, of companies or that do well in politics have some Capricorn influence. And um, their only real challenge is, you know, they feel like they need to win respect. They feel like they need to prove themselves. Uh, they, they like traditional approaches. Um, they, like, they like understanding the history of things, but they're not always very good at knowing how to use that to inform their current way of going, like their current, their path forward is not clear to them because they're so set on what it was like in the past. So there's a component of stubbornness, but it's not as firm as like it would be for Taurus because it's also, it's cardinal, right? So it's like a sand castle. It's a firm, solid structure, but if you kick it, it's going to just go flying, right? It's not, it's made of sand. <laughs> um, but then if you leave something, like, if you leave, like, you know, bits of uh, some kind of mineral lying around for long enough, eventually it forms a crystal. So crystal is also kind of aligned with the Capricorn energy. And it's the idea that sand can turn into crystals or, you know, that, sand, you know, that idea that dust becomes form is Capricorn. So that's the energy there. Okay. Uh, and I take some extra time to explain it because I'm very hard on Capricorn. I am born under Saturn Capricorn. My Saturn is retrograde. It rules my life. I hate it. <laughs> my dad is very, very Capricorn. And I hate him. No, I love him. <laughs> but, um, you know, but he sucks <laughs> because of the Capricorn energy. So, yeah. So Capricorn's rough. And thank God Saturn is not in Capricorn anymore because it's going retrograde, but this time it's in Aquarius. That's way better for me anyway. <laughs> Sorry if it's bad for you, but it's good for me. Okay, Aquarius. Aquarius is the uh, fixed air sign and it, it aligns with the water bearer. Aquarius is ruled by, um, some say Uranus, some say Saturn. I think it's ruled by Saturn. To me, it feels very much like Saturn is the ruler and Saturn has a, a big stake in Aquarius energy. But um, maybe Uranus does as well, and I just don't care as much about Uranus. I'm not sure. Um, Aquarius is very big on understanding the potential of something, the potential of the human race, um, the most efficient way of doing something. Uh, what are the parameters required to get this outcome that you're looking for? Very Aquarius. Um, they often will like exile themselves because they like think too much. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and Aquariuses tend to not be fans of commitment or community. Um, they like different quirky kinds of groups of people um, where they can easily blend in because they're usually like their head is in the clouds and they've got this kind of like dreamy sort of watery kind of influence in their lives. And uh, as a result of that, people can think that they're like aloof or standoffish. They're very detached from their emotions, they tend to feel like they're watching their lives from a distance. 
and that's Aquarius energy. It's very evolved sign. It's close to the end. Um, you know, it's aligned with uh, enlightenment for some traditions. Um, and at the same time, people who are Aquariuses uh, can be selfish in their personal daily lives. They can feel so detached from their emotional experiences or the experiences of others that, you know, it's hard for them to act with thought for those around them. Um, and they're less concerned with, like, you're not going to find an Aquarius at a soup kitchen handing out soup. They don't have any, they would get nothing out of that. <laughs> it would just be so boring. You're going to find an Aquarius sitting down and figuring out what is the most efficient way to run soup kitchens so that I can feed the most number of people in the most areas. Where do we put them to maximize the efficiency of getting everybody soup? That's what Aquarius is spend their time on. <laughs> We are headed this summer for a large Aquarian influence uh, when the Saturn goes retrograde. So I hope everyone's ready to get their humanitarianism on. Because <laughs> people are going to be like, yeah, humanitarianism is so cool. I know people like did that. It's, people go through phases with that, but it's going to be some of the strongest sense of, for that that we've had for a long time. So, okay, next, Pisces. Pisces is the two fish. Uh, it aligns with the feet. It's ruled by Neptune. Um, it's the water of air. So clouds, right? So when you go through Aquarius, you bring the water up into the clouds. Now you're in Pisces. That's, it's kind of like that metaphor of like how they all connect. And um, Pisces tend to be very mystical and dreamy. They can be secretive, but usually it's because other people just will not understand. So what's the point in telling them? <laughs> um, they are very sensitive as well. So they don't like to tell people things if they feel self-conscious about them. Um, they tend to be very spiritual and very magical. And Pisces is uh, like the gateway, right? So um, there is another sign we're going to talk about in a minute that shares the 12th house and actually a little bit of the 1st and 11th houses as well because it's a huge sign. But mostly it's in the 12th house, um, and it aligns with the same energy a little bit, um, but it's more of the darker side. So Pisces is a very kind of positive energy. Um, they're very loving, empathic people that give too much of themselves, and it's hard for them to know what's true and what's not true. People with a lot of Pisces influence tend to dissociate a lot and um, have dissociative disorders or you know just issue determining illusion from illumination right is it helping you uh and then it's a positive delusion or is it hurting you in which case it's out of control it's a bad delusion and it's got to go right so a lot of pisces people are struggle with being able to um to assess that and especially they're susceptible to gaslighting a lot of pisces tend to be chronic abuse victims and it's very difficult for them to like break themselves out of bad relationships because they're just so, so self selfless and give of themselves all the time. And they rarely ever give up on people and they're very big on unconditional love. Uh, and they often will see auras and have and be empaths, people that have a lot of Pisces influence. So that's Pisces. Okay. Ophicus. Ophicus is one of the newer signs. It's been on the Zodiac the whole time, but the sun only was in it for like three or four days when they wrote all this down. And then everyone forgot about it because it was only three or four days. And now it's like three or four weeks. <laughs> it's like three weeks. Um, and Scorpio is only like three or four days. <laughs> so Ophicus is pretty significant now. A lot of people are born under Ophicus. It, people say that it's the serpent, uh, but it has this alternative um, interpretation as being like a whale. And I think that one's a better one. It's not, it doesn't feel like a serpent to me. They align it with the serpent because they demonized the mother goddess and called her Tiamat, demon of the dark ocean, chaotic and untamable. And that's true. She's chaotic and untamable. Why does that make her a demon? She doesn't do what she wants. So she's a demon. That's crazy. So Ophicus aligns with chaos, and it's constructive chaos. It's chaos that brings about more order. So deity using chaos to turn disorder to order. Uh, its ruling planet is Ceres, which is one of the dwarf planets we've discovered recently. And Ophicus is not very well defined. A lot of people just flat out reject it. Um, but 
the planets do spend a lot of time in it these days because of planetary precession, which is just like the plane of the solar system is irregular. The orbits are irregular. They wobble. The sun wobbles. Everything, it's irregular. So you get the plane shifting about. And some of the signs are more on the zodiac or off the zodiac at different times. And that should matter, right? Shouldn't it matter? I mean, it's going to be a different influence. People said that it mattered in the past, and then everyone just forgot about it because it was so nice and convenient to have 12 signs and 12 houses. <laughs> it's so easy back then, the good old days. But it does matter. And, it, it, and I found it very important, the difference between Scorpio and Ophicus, the difference between Pisces and Cetus, massive, big difference. Similar energy, but completely the opposite. So. It really does matter, and I hope that you guys will take that into account. People who are born under Ophicus are very adventurous. They really want to, like, go and do and see and explore. They're constantly transforming. So people used to give this transformative energy to Scorpio, and that's just not. Scorpios are not transformative. They struggle to change. Um, they struggle to adapt. They're very full and very, um, they're very, like, great emotions that occur over vast spaces right so it's like difficult to change when you're in the dark depths of the o ocean where there's a lot of pressure it's difficult to change course then right so transformative doesn't really work um, people have been trying to make it work i've heard many rationalizations for why it should work that to me were like I don't think so. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Um, but that's because they're really describing Ophicus. <laughs> so they're just, they got the energy right. And they're doing the star charts, probably. They're doing them right. They're still thinking about it the right way. They're just calling it the wrong, they're calling it Scorpio, and they should call it Ophicus. So people are talking about it. Since the time when I made that astrology course and did a Google search and found nobody talking about it through now, I see lots of people talking about it. So hopefully people are starting to listen and look at these signs because it really does matter. Okay. Cetus is the opposite. Cetus is destructive chaos, demons and disorder, turning ordered things into disordered ones. Uh, the sun does not currently move through Cetus. Uh, the moon does. So we're seeing a lot of Cetus moons, and we're seeing a lot of destructive chaos in the world. That trend is probably going to continue. Now, Cetus is ruled by another dwarf planet called Eris. Um, it is the sea monster, okay, the dark, the darkness that hides and waits until you let your guard down and then snatches you up, destructs, destroys everything. So they have the challenge of learning how to be constructively destructive. <laughs> so people with a lot of Cetus influence or people that are born with Cetus on the horizon, um, me for once, <laughs> um, they are the kinds of people that like to recycle and repurpose, like to hold on to things. You'll find people who have this sign can sometimes be hoarders because they just like don't like to let go of things. Or they could just be like, they are totally minimalist and have nothing in their house and they're like a psycho. Okay, the, they're like crazy. This is the sign of madness, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It's not It's not very well characterized. It's something that I'm still working on. Even this lecture right now is more informed than the one I made a few years ago. <laughs> so I've been doing charts and looking at them and learning more about them and seeing the moon move through them more and more. So that's uh, that's helping to learn more about them. But uh, Cetus frightens me and has a very bad influence generally on everyone. So I call it the sea monster myself. <laughs> and that's and that's Cetus. OK, so now we're going to move on and talk about some of the planets. The planets are the actors. The zodiac sign is their costume. The house is the stage. So now we're talking about the actors. What are they like? OK, well, each planet represents an archetype of life, of consciousness, and of being. And as they orbit the zodiac signs, we can interpret the relationship with each other. We can use the signs behind them as a way of knowing where they are and keeping track of that uh, as a way of relating to their actual position with respect to the Earth. Right? So that's how we can relate to it and have a relationship with it so that we can make sense of it in an in intuitive way, which is required because it's such a complex calculation that a computer could not do it right now. We could not build an, an equation to do it. Maybe one day people will help me do that. People who are actually good at math. Cough, the people I know who are going to watch this video. Okay, anyway, retrograde planets, those are the ones who appear to move backwards. 
They appear brighter in the sky while this is happening. They're not really moving backwards. They're really just orbiting the sun, but we're moving and rotating and such as well. So with respect to us, they appear to move backwards. And that gives them an intensity of influence over us. Uh, for some reason, when this effect is happening, it causes that particular planet to be more influential in whatever capacity it is currently influencing us, which will depend on where it is and what it is, which signs that it's in. Okay, so that's an overview. First, let's talk about the solar house. The solar house or, or your solar month is uh, whatever the conventional dates would have you. So I was born on 9991, so I would be a Virgo. So my solar house is Virgo. And when people see me, they think I'm a Virgo. They think I am very, very biased. They think that when they see me, it is that when they hear me speak. My friend Tate, he's always laughing at me because I'll just say something that sounds completely mad and it's perfectly well reasoned but it sounds completely mad. So I always, nowadays, I just tell people to forgive my madness and listen, because usually there's good things under that mad surface, but people constantly, they hear that. They're like, how could those things possibly be connected? Obviously you've got some bias going on. People project ego onto me. That's all because my solar house is Virgo, but my sun sign uh, is Leo, and um, and I have uh, a lot of influence of Leo um, in myself and how I express and how I think and how I interact with the world in a conscious way. Um, so there's like a misperception there and a miscommunication. Just by being, just by speaking the way that I speak, um, people will think things about me that are not true. That's what happens when your solar house and your sun sign differ, which happens for a lot of people. It's very common. The first planet we're going to talk about is one of the luminary planets. That means it produces light or um, that it reflects light in the case of the moon, but it's bright. <laughs> and it's a source of light to see by. That's a luminary planet. So the sun is the first of those, and it aligns with fire and spirit and divinity. And it's body parts that it governs are the heart and the spine, which makes sense because we've talked about what those things mean and how the chakras align and all the things we've talked about now. So you're starting to see that there's a theory behind all of this, that witchcraft is really, uh, it's kind of a, a method in a way. It's a, it's a metaphysical method. It's less rigorous and more uh, designed to help you relate to the things that you're trying to influence, right? Because relating to them, it turns out matters if you're gonna influence them. You can't influence a person you don't relate to. They'll just be like, what are you even saying? <laughs> you have to like relate to them and get along with them and understand them first, and then you can convince them of your truth that you want them to know. So you're starting to see hopefully all the correlate correlations and associations, and that is, the theory of witchcraft, that everything is connected somehow, right? There's a process that we all share, this process of existence itself, of life, that we all have some stake in. That's witchcraft. So you're starting to see that. Good. Now back to the sun. We're talking about a planet that is aligned with Leo, rules the fifth house. Its day is Sunday, obviously. <laughs> Today, yay. Um, the colors are gold, orange, yellow, and sometimes red. And it's a luminary planet that governs how the world sees you, like how you choose to interact with the world. Um, it's yourself, your um, creative self, your expression um, in a deliberate sense. So who you want others to see you as, in addition to how they actually see you. Um, but the solar house kind of is that toggle of like, do they see the person that you want them to see? So that's where that solar house sun difference comes in. Okay, so next we've got the moon. The moon is um, like the subconsciousness um, or the unconsciousness. It's like the, it's the part of you that is not, like that you're not consciously hearing a voice or, um, you're not having some like thread in your conscious mind that you're aware of what's going on necessarily. So it's like the emotional self um, and uh, the deeper parts of the self 
um, and just like the inner waters and the memories and how someone relates to everything that they have experience with, like, you know, they have some conscious take on it. That would be like the governed by the sun. But then how does it influence them in a deeper way? How do they experience that thing would be the moon. And each of these has a return. What that means when a planet returns, that means it's back to the start. Uh, it's back to where it was initially when you were born. And so you have a renewed sense of whatever that is. It's like you're starting over. You're in a new cycle. It's just like a refreshing kind of take on that energy. And so for the sun, that's 365 days a year, right? That's your birthday. And for the moon, you have a return every 28 days, give or take, because <laughs> the moon phase is not, the moon cycle is not perfectly 28 days, but it's pretty close. Um, so that is your, your emotional return. It's like your time to just be like, okay, I feel fresh now. And that's why people use the moons for charging and cleansing, right? The moon is intimately tied with our emotional selves. So that's why. Okay, Mercury. Uh, Mercury uh, lines the element air, but also a little bit with water um, and the nerves and the lungs and Gemini and Virgo, which is an earth sign. So that's why I'm like, does Mercury align with Virgo or does Uranus uh, align with Virgo? Because maybe they're not putting these planets in the right places exactly. I'm not sure. I'm just giving you guys the ones that most people look at the most, but um honestly you know astrology it's an art it's not a science <laughs> um it's far from a science it's very interpretive so it's it's critical that you have a relationship with this for yourself and that you can see the theory manifesting in your own experiences in your own way and that's why you have to do your own natal chart before you can even start with astrology because you have to know how these concepts influence you directly like where's your bias you know that's important so um so I hope you're going to go ahead and look into your natal chart once we're done with all of this, and I'll talk about that at the end. As far as Mercury goes, um, some people would put uh, associate with different colors. It governs communication, your expression, um, travel, uh, outreach, any kind of like meetings. Um, your work life often um, is influenced by Mercury as well as Mars, which governs productivity. Mercury has an 88-day return. It goes retrograde two to three times a year. Uh, so it's um, got sort of like a seasonal, it's got like seasons to it. So um, the season of Mercury, people might say that, that just means the Mercury is retrograde. <laughs> um, so you may hear people refer to those retrogrades in different ways. And Mercury excites people. Uh, it excites the nerves, it can cause anxiety, it can cause issues with public speaking, miscommunications, technology failures, uh, uh, canceled or changed travel plans. It, Mercury's retrograde right now. Um, actually, or did the retro retrograde just ended? Yeah, so my friend is traveling this weekend and I was just like, Ugh, I'll pray for you. <laughs> it's not a good weekend to travel. Mercury's still on the cusp of Cetus, so it's scary. It's just scary. Oh, I hope he doesn't die. Anyway, Venus. <laughs> so Venus has uh, associations with the Earth. Also, sometimes with air and sometimes with water, right? So it goes with many signs. Um, it stays Friday. That's because uh, of the Germanic version of Venus, which is Freya. So Freya Day, <laughs> Friday. Um, it's got different color associations too. So again, you're going to have to decide how it makes sense to you. Uh, but Venus governs relationships, um, how you get along with people, uh, how you set expectations. Um, it's got a 225 day return. It represents what's going on in people's relationships, not just their interpersonal relationships, but also their relationships with, uh, concepts and ideas as well. People tend to be more creative when Venus is going through certain phases or is retrograde. Um, so strength through balance and refinement and knowing when to speak and how to be diplomatic, that's all Venus. Now the Earth sign um, is something that nobody agrees <laughs> with how you determine what it is. It's not very significant. It, go it governs how people ground or like what their past lives may have been like. It doesn't say as much about their current life. So I almost never refer to this in natal charts. 
Um, but it's some people say that it's a triangle that is formed from um, the sign after the sun sign, uh, the opposition to the sun sign, and the sun itself. So it's like a really thin, narrow triangle, and that it's like this complex triangle. It's there are so many different ways to talk about what the earth sign is. I threw it in here. I don't often look for where this supposed earth placement is. I don't know how to make sense of that personally, but maybe it makes more sense to some of you. Mars uh, as a planet aligns with fire. Um, it's aligned with Aries. Historically, it was aligned with Scorpio, but it makes more sense to align Pluto with Scorpio. So I'm comfortable with that change. So I usually just think of Mars and Aries going together. Um, it stays Tuesday because of the Germanic, the god Tu, um, and it's about the personality in the sense of assertion and will, uh, your desire to manifest and how well you manifest, um, so uh, progress and productivity. And it's a call to action. So um, sometimes it'll make you feel like you have to do a particular kind of thing, depending on where it's located. Jupiter, uh, this one is uh, a planet that urges towards exploration and growth. So it most often governs people's spirituality and how they connect um, to spiritual consciousness or the nature of their spirituality, how much spiritual intelligence they have. Uh, Jupiter is a pretty clear indicator of all of that stuff. Um, it also can reflect abundance and wealth and opportunity, um, but that's a little less common. It also can represent contraction as well as expansion. You know, what goes up must come down. So um, it's this kind of like ebb and flow kind of energy. And when it transitions into a new sign, you get this sort of loss of one thing and gain of another so it's got this very like ebb and flow influence on our lives it has a 12 year return so when you're starting to get to these larger planets um, that return less often the return becomes more significant it feels more like a change like a refreshment because it happens less often so it's just more noticeable um, and because these planets are also more massive, so that probably has something to do with it. Saturn is another one that has a very strong return every 28 to 30 years. And it uh, rules Capricorn. Sometimes they put it in Aquarius as well. Um, it's day Saturday, Saturn day, right? So that one is makes sense. And it governs structure, order, and time and how you spend your time. And um, when you get that Saturn return... You see reorganization and restructuring and just chaos of some kind, and they call it the hoarder's nightmare. Some people very dread, very much dread the Saturn return. I didn't mind mine. Uranus uh, is a planet of um, air, but also it's a little fiery. It's a little watery. It's the Aquarius sign, which is like... <laughs> Is it a water sign? No. Is it an air sign? Yes, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah, Uranus is the same way. And um, Uranus is um, the collective consciousness. So usually in a person's chart, Uranus will determine how they're interacting with social media, um, how uh, impactful social media is on their life, um, how do they engage with, um, you know, any kind of media, um, any kind of coming together in a large group, how do they retain their sense of individuality, um, how well influenced are they. So there's a lot of um, things you can learn about a person from their Uranus placement, but it's uh, a very slow planet. So a lot of people will have the same placements for Uranus and Neptune and Pluto, and that's why these are the planets that really start to govern the differences between generations. Then there's Neptune. Neptune governs the uh, collective subconscious, right? So not the collective unconscious, that's Pluto, but um, how we all come to decide things as a society when we don't necessarily speak about it. Um, you know, nobody sat down in a room, all of us in, together in the whole world didn't sit down in a room and decide that we hate school shootings. We just saw them happen and we decided that they're bad and that we should stop them from happening probably. And then how we do that causes us all to argue again. 
right? But that decision that that's a bad thing that makes us unhappy as a society that we're not going to allow this comes from Neptune. That's the influence of Neptune. That's the unconscious, unspoken decision that's come from our feelings about something, that something makes us uncomfortable. That's enough. We don't need to sit down and have a rational reason for why we should stop that from happening. <laughs> we just agree that it should stop. Um, so that's Neptune. It um, governs people's awareness of that influence, of their place in the greater oneness of the world. Um, and it has a 165 year return. So many people will say they feel this refreshed sense every 14 years instead, uh, because the Neptune return does not happen in a lifetime. <laughs> um, so I just personally, I just don't think that it's, I think it's more of a generational thing. I don't think that these outer planets influence people as much in the absence of the social media and society component. Um, and the people that are far away from society that are not experiencing it as much for whatever reason. I mean, I do charts for people all around the world. So it, lots of different kinds of people from all walks of life. And those who are less connected with modern society are less influenced by these outer planets. At least Uranus and Neptune. Pluto, they're usually still influenced by. Because Pluto aligns with the collective unconscious it is as carl jung called it right it is and he's and he's a psychologist a famous psychologist carl jung the jungian archetypes they're good it's good psychology and um it's basically just the archetypes of our lives the archetypes of human existence that we all have in common because we all have similar biology and similar life experiences born of that biology um, and many believe there's a spiritual component as well for reasons of metaphysics that we've talked about previously, as above, so below, as below, so above. So therefore, we're all one spiritually and we can come to know all kinds of things through Pluto, how that is moving around will influence what kinds of spirituality people are drawn to um, and how they come to understand the collective unconsciousness and how that manifests in their own life and their relationship with these archetypes will be governed by the Pluto placement. Um, and there some, are some other planets. Uh, Pluto is a dwarf planet in what's called the Kuiper Belt, which is um, a big uh, cloud, um, a big like circle of asteroids. And there are other asteroids that are large enough to be considered and their impact on us um, and those ones really are Eris and Ceres. Um, Eris is, of, is actually larger than Pluto. Uh, Eris is a planet that for now is inside of Cetus and hasn't left Cetus for a long time. Uh, it rules Cetus and the only influence from it that I have found is if it's retrograde there is a much stronger uh, influence from any chaos. Um, be it destructive or constructive. Chaos will be intensified if Eris is retrograde. But it hasn't left Cetus, so it's entirely possible that um, it's going to have some different influence if that ever happens. It has a very irregular orbit, so it's difficult to know what to do with Eris. <laughs> Ceres is more regular. Uh, it still is a little bit irregular, especially when it goes retrograde. I've been watching Ceres lately. It definitely is impactful. Um, it is about half the size of Pluto, a little over half. Um, it's considered an asteroid in conventional astrology. I think it should be considered a dwarf planet. I think it should be considered to rule Ophicus. Uh, and I think it represents how we relate to disorder. Pluto governs how you relate to order, the divine component, and Ceres governs how you relate to disorder, the demonic component. The houses are tied to the rising sun. So the first thing you have to do is look to the east and find whatever's on the horizon and uh, put that in the rising box and that will tell you what the rising sign is, which is significant because that is the essence of who a person is even when no one is looking. 
and uh, it will also um, it reflects the orientation of the Earth uh, with regard to the plane of the solar system. So all the rest of them are meaningful as well, but just less so. Um, they all you know fill in a box, uh, and then you put the planets on top of those, and then you can interpret it. Um, so which sign is in which house does make some difference, but usually only once interpreted through the lens of the planet, right? So like we said, the house is the stage. And the house derives its meaning from its ruling sign. Um, and that's why, you know, the first one, the first house is I am because it represents the true self, the essence or the soul of a person in the sense of like their spirit, their fire, their inner flame. And um, they all go around like that. I possess, right? So that's finances and possession, uh, anchor, uh, stability, foundation. The third house is self-expression. You have presentation, personnel traits, and, um, you know, modes of expression. Uh, that's what Gemini is like, right? So the fourth house, you have I attract, um, I want to be surrounded by, um, you know, who, what, what kind of community comes to define you. That's the fourth house, your family, your home life, uh, how extroverted a person is will be determined by whatever is located in that fourth house oftentimes. Creative efforts and products manifestation, that's the fifth house, I create, right? That's Leo, that's fire, that's manifestation. That goes in the fifth. For the sixth house, you have the house that governs career um, and how you wind up spending your time usually in a pr productive sense in um, uh, a contributing to society capacity or uh, making money, right? So you're calling. What are you called to do? But that's the sixth house. Uh, that's why in the chart it says, I collaborate. Uh, how do you interact with society? That's the sixth one. And the seventh is relationships and how you learn and how you teach. How do you interact with the people around you? Uh, how, what kind of uh, love do you seek out? Uh, house eight uh, is about transformations and endings. Uh, rebirth and, and uh, growth um, within a lifetime. So when you fail at something, picking yourself back up and continuing. How well do you do that? What motivates you to do that? That would be the eighth house or whatever's located in the eighth house. Um, and how divine will manifests into your daily life as well. How do you make use of any blessings that are given to you? And how do you uh, return any harm that is given to you? That would be governed by the eighth house and what's located in it. The ninth is governed by like journeys of the mind, uh, reaching out, experiencing, um, practicing empathy, um, engaging in decisive action or sharing. So the ninth one, the tagline is I extend, right? So I reach out. That's the energy of Sagittarius, right? Uh, for 10th, you have public status, um, achievement, and legacy, and your life's accomplishments, and the opinion of the public. So it is, once again, I am. But this time, it is I am in the sense of how does everyone else see me, and how will they remember me? And then you get to 11, which has the legacy component of that. So now what good came of how they will know me, right? So what philosophies and values did I experience in life? You know, what catalyzing opinions and actions do I take that bring about actual improvements that, that formulate ideals and standards? So that would be the 11th, I formulate. And then in the 12th, you have I distribute, uh, but I'm not sure how well I vibe with that particular take on it because the 12th house is um, is in large part, um, it's about introspection and internalization and how you relate to things uh, and like where you draw wisdom from. So um that translates to I distribute in the sense of how well do you then give that wisdom back to others? Uh, it's a sign of unconditional love, right? So the Pisces influence on that sign uh, or the Cetus, right, is all about unleashing extreme energy, be it love, 
or hatred. So um, it gets this like I distribute uh, tagline that is probably not the most significant influence. Uh, for most people, the 12th house is really just like, how do they internalize things? How do they make sense of the world? And between the 11th and the 12th house, it'll tell you like what kind of spiritual path they're most drawn to and how they um, best relate to spiritual topics in general and uh, and philosophy and what are their morals and values like as well. And how much time do they spend caring about that? <laughs> Okay, so the last thing to talk about when it comes to understanding astrology would be aspects. Um, there are many kinds of aspects, in the, there are many aspects in each chart. Um, aspects describe the chemistry between the actors, right? How well do they act together? Do they act to reinforce each other? Are they constructive actors or do they act to destroy each other? So, um, yeah, so there's like a lot of them and they're very complex. This is like the rabbit hole that is astrology. There are systems of astrology that will care about the locations of the planets down to a single degree. Like people go crazy for this. Um, but for the most part, the ones that I take notice of, the conjunction, that's when they're pretty much on the same degree uh, or within uh, maybe a couple of degrees many will say zero degrees formed it's, they're not really calculating that though so for me i just kind of eyeball it and i'm like oh those are on the same line those are like lined up oh those are conjunct those are reinforcing each other and i can just see that plain as day in a chart when i go to look it up and i look at the actual sky um, the next one would be uh, the square, that 90 degree angle, or the semi-square, which is a 45 degree angle, and they're similar, right? So they're like fate or like um, difficulties, uh, unavoidable things, but in one case it's like the things that are unavoidable because it's the result of your own actions that you've already made in the past. Whereas the other is like, okay, there's things coming up that are unavoidable that had never had anything to do with your actions in the first place. Then you have the trine, that's the 120 degrees. Uh, that one's more difficult to spot just looking at it. So I don't look at it very often, but it's said to represent the creative spark or source of inspiration and imagination. Um, it doesn't come up often for me. One that does come up more often is the sextile or the semi-sextile where things are pretty much perfectly one um, chunk, one house uh, apart. Uh, and then that usually will represent either an opportunity for change or a lack of opportunity for change. And then there's a couple more. Uh, another one that's very common that does come up a lot for me is the opposition. If planets are directly opposite each other, then that means polarized action and that they're competing with each other and drawing away from each other. People that have a lot of oppositions in their chart often feel like they're being stretched in many directions. So that's something that happens very often the quintile and the quincunx injection are not as common uh i they i just don't like i it's difficult to eyeball it it's like for me it's just not that important uh to look at but if you do look at it they say it represents harmony equilibrium or flow and that the larger angle represents discord disequilibrium or ebb okay Getting close to the end here, this um, next couple of slides is about the age of Aquarius, the Aquarian age, as they say. Okay, so today, 321, 2023, the sun is in Pisces, or this year, not today, but in today's day and age. <laughs> this year, the sun is in Pisces when it rises on the spring equinox and that's the case every year in fact but it won't be the case forever because of a phenomenon called precession of the equinoxes uh, the sun will eventually be rising in aquarius and that is what they mean when they say the age of pisces and the age of aquarius so it's believed to be something that influences us all uh, across a whole age it influences the nature of that age so the age of Pisces was one of emotion and dissociation and delusion and mobs being crazy 
<laughs> emotions running high, not a lot of reason, right? So the age of reason began um, pretty close to when the sun entered the cusp of Aquarius and it's building and building. And it will be fully in Aquarius by 2700. <laughs> so the age of Aquarius technically doesn't start until 2700 CE. So like 700 years from now. <laughs> the 2600s will mark the transformation the most because the sun will jump in and out of Aquarius and Pisces year by year uh, throughout most of that century. And by 2700, it is surely in Aquarius and not moving back into Pisces at all. So that is when the age is fully shifted into the age of Aquarius, an age of humanitarianism and reason, uh, but also potentially emotional detachment uh and um and um and maybe it'll be robots maybe it won't be humans maybe it'll be robots that are in charge of the world we'll see because aquariuses are like robots that's true but we don't know we can't know uh all we know is that um <laughs> the aquarian age is starting and we are its ushers <laughs> and we'll see what happens as time goes on now, if you want to draw your own natal chart, I suggest you use Stellarium to do that. Stellarium is an astronomy tool. I used it to line up telescopes in college. Uh, it's very accurate. It uses a library called VSOP87. Anything that uses that library will correct the data for planetary precession and is accurate. I don't know of any astrology tools that do that. <laughs> I don't think you could plug your birthday and time into any astrology tool and get accurate information. You really have to use Stellarium or some other astronomy tool. Stellarium is open source. It is free on PC. The mobile app version is like 250 one time or something. I, or it's free now, but you can unlock new features. I don't know. It's not expensive. Like just use Stellarium. <laughs> it's so much better. <laughs> Um, you could probably use other apps like Google Sky or something. There's probably other ones too. Um, but yeah, I would not trust most astrology sites. But what you're going to do is you're going to take this chart. And this is one of the exercises, which we're going to get to in a minute. Exercise three of chapter four. You're going to take this chart and you're going to plug in your date and time and location into Stellarium. And make sure you turn on the constellation boundaries, which is under star lore. And then you look to the east. You see what's rising? It can be more than one sign. If it's more than one sign, I will go to the middle of this circle and I will draw a line right down the center of all of this, of all of this little uh, strips. Okay, so I will draw 12 lines <laughs> or 11 lines, what, whatever, there's 12 houses. And then I will write the sign, I will place the sign, well, I will actually just copy and paste the little image of the sign, the little icon on top of the line, right? So if you have two rising signs, like say for me, I have Aquarius and Pisces rising. So I would just draw a line down the first box and put Aquarius on the top of that line and Pisces under that line and then split all the boxes in half. And that's just a sign of a more chaotic person. That person has some proneness to chaos. And I do. <laughs> so, ergo de facto. Um, but yeah, so I will just start in the east, draw the whole chart in with all of the zodiac signs. Um, I split the house that contains Scorpio uh, in the other direction. I put a little line there and put Scorpio on the inside and Ophicus on the outside. And then I also split the houses that contain um, Pisces and Aquarius and put Cetus there or Pisces and Aries and put Cetus there. And when I do which just depends on like the time of year and the date and the location of the, on the earth. Like it, Cetus is really in all three of those houses. I say that it splits the 12th house officially. That's how you derive its meaning and the theory behind it. Uh, but when I draw it, in order to draw, to render it correctly as a three-dimensional shape in a two-dimensional image, it often winds up in 
two or three houses at, at once. So what I'll have to do is just give you an example of my chart. <laughs> I'll have to put my chart somewhere on the internet so that everyone can look at it because um, that happens in my chart. <laughs> I have Cetus rising, so go figure. So that's how you do it. Uh, all the symbols are here. I don't usually rely on the aspects or nodes as much. Um, when I make this video, I'm going to put a link here at the end to the astrology video where I actually show you how to do the natal chart. Um, and it's a tutorial. So you should probably watch that and then ask me questions if you're still confused. <laughs> so for those of you who are watching on YouTube, there will be um, a link up in the corner. <laughs> Go click on that. And there's a tutorial on how to do the Stellarium thing. And you should try to draw your own chart. If you can't figure it out, you can't draw your own chart, you don't think you're doing it right, I am happy to help you. Email me, covenantoftheopenmind at gmail.com. DM me on my server, and I'll draw you one up. And then you can just interpret it, which is easier. Okay. Now, the homework for this time, it's a lot less reading. It's only 147 to 151 pages. It's like five pages, barely. A lot of it's just a list of stuff that you don't remember. <laughs> you just look at. Um, something that you should write in your Book of Shadows. You should know that Aries is the fire of Earth. You should know that Taurus is the Earth of Earth. You should write down and understand the theory um, of like how we derive the zodiac and its meanings from first principles, right? So how do we derive it from um, the witchcraft? So that's something that you should know how to do, probably. You should know what the planet's symbols are. Uh, you should know when they're going to transition. Um, all of these things are going to influence you and your practice, especially as you become more sensitive to um, the workings of the external world as you seek to become more sensitive so that you can be more psychic and more influential in your magical practice, you will naturally be more affected by astrology. So it is important to keep track of what's going on in the heavens. It's unfortunate because it's kind of a lot of work, but I try to make that easier on everyone. There will be a link in the description to our Open Minded Path website. Uh, our Lineage website has a blog, and I go ahead and put all of the transitions for the next six months up there every six months. Um, so that you don't have to go to Stellarium every time you forgot where Mercury is going to be uh, when you're trying to schedule your next out of town. <laughs> okay, so um, I try to make it easier for people because I know it's a lot. Uh, so it's less reading this week for the homework, less questions. Um, it, the questions are really just about the Zodiac anyway. Um, it's all up in the Google Classroom. You're welcome to submit stuff. I'm going to be catching up on submissions before June. You should be catching up on your reading. Um, we are going to do our dedications in June. So I'm going to talk a bit about the dedication statements. That's why the exercises are going back to Chapter 2. Exercise one, we're going to look back at our dedication statements of intent, our uh, uh, dedication drafts that we were writing, dedication statement drafts. We're going to look back at those and finalize them, get them ready so that we can actually do dedication ceremony. If you want to dedicate with us, there's a full moon, the second full moon of Beltane on June 3rd. We're going to do ritual together and you guys can join us for that. The other uh, two exercises in chapter four, um, exercise one, I put again, that's the one about casting circle. So if you can't cast circle, you can't do a remote dedication. If you were not a solitary and you were dedicating into an actual coven, you would not have to cast circle for yourself because I could cast circle for all of us. But if you're remote, you have to cast circle so that we can link our circles so that we can feel your energy as you do the dedication or else we can't help you reinforce that and get the commitment you're looking for. So that's why I'm having everyone go back to exercise one make sure you're casting circle make sure you're casting circle and summoning the elements that's key to linking the circles if you don't summon the elements your circle is not in a space between spaces and we won't be able to link it um, the other thing is uh, exercise three gives you more information on how to jot down your natal chart uh, um, and you can also find this image in the Google Classroom as well if you'd like to look for it there. Okay, so let's talk a bit about dedication statements. Dedication statements should be poetic, emphatic, dramatic. They are words of power. They should sound powerful. 
They should sound deliberate. They should be highly ordered, like all spells. You have to care where the syllables fall in a line. It has to flow. It has to be natural. It also must be an expression of yourself. It can be spoken once and done, or it could be chanted like a spell. That will depend on you. It is a spell uh, of, of, an, of its own kind of nature. Uh, it doesn't involve generating energy as much um, because, you know, ideally you've done that. Ideally, as a dedicant, you're coming into the space energized for this new tradition. So it's kind of like a spell, but it's a little different because you're not raising the energy together as a part of the spell. It's your energy that you need. You offer that energy before us. We reinforce that energy, and that helps bring about commitment for you to stay on your path. You can dedicate with us and not dedicate to our group, by the way, if you want to just do a dedication with a group and then go off to initiate someone somewhere else. That's also fine. If you want to join us, June 3rd in our Discord server, we're going to do it together. We link our circles and do it metaphysically. Um, and I'm happy to help people work on those dedication statements. If you want to send me an email or reply to the um, coursework in the classroom, it, you're welcome to still reach out to me with your dedication statement. If you're watching this too late and you're like, oh, can I still dedicate? You can do your own self-dedication. We may offer a second round of dedications later in the summer. I haven't decided on that yet. It will depend on the stars. And then anyone who wants to initiate with us can initiate for Sawin. You can do your own self-dedication and initiate with us. You can also come in as an initiate if you've already done dedicant work in the past and you are essentially an initiate. We are not the kind of tradition that makes people start over from scratch because I'm not teaching you how to do things my way. Um, I'm really, our lineage is really people who join our lineage like formally and certify because our lineage is open. So you can call yourself open-minded Wiccan and do whatever you want. Honestly, I don't care. But um, yeah, if people want to become a leader, then we want to be like, no, no, we trust this person to be a leader. They can be affiliated with us, right? So that's why we have a certification process. But um, yeah, we don't require people to start over. We want people to come in with experience if they have that experience then welcome you know bring it bring it but yeah and but anyone who wants to join with us who's new to wicca and has not done a dedication or you took some time off and you want to rededicate you can join us if you are interested if you need help writing your statement let me know dedication statements often they will talk about what brought you to the path um, what, what are your inspirations? What are your morals? Do you plan to, you know, you'll use phrasing like in love and light. Uh, I recommend that everyone go back to chapter two. Now that we've learned how to do mind altering meditation, now that we're casting circle and doing witchcraft, go back to chapter two, flip through the sections on being a witch, uh, a, or on being Wiccan, flip through the sections on, um, you know, what does it mean to believe in Wiccan deity, like the Wiccan qualities of deity? Now is the time to dwell on what makes the path Wicca and not just any path. Because if you're dedicating to Wicca, you're going to be a very specific kind of witch. And then go read the original Wiccan read again and get some inspiration on how to phrase things, right? How do witches speak? Well, they speak like this. Bide the wicked laws ye must in perfect love and perfect trust. Live and let live. Fairly take and fairly give. Ch cast the circle thrice about to keep all evil spirits out. Right? Do you hear the cadence? It's simple. It's straightforward. It's not verbose. It's not relying on the words themselves to be grandiose. The words have power because you say they do. <laughs> They should be meaningful to you. If that means using big words, by all means do so. But for a lot of people, it doesn't mean, you know, poetry is not some big complex. It has to be fancy and eloquent. No, no, those words are not on my slide here. It does not have to be fancy or eloquent or any of those things. It has to flow. It has to sound like poetry. It has to make you feel like you're expressing yourself when you recite it. That's it. 
<laughs> that's a dedication statement. <laughs> okay, so uh, if you're having concerns still and you can't figure it out, come on our server, DM me, shoot me an email. I am happy to help you figure that out. And that's it for today's class. So I hope that you guys all feel ready to dedicate and that your dedication uh, ceremonies go well if you do not do them with us. And from everyone here at the Coven of the Open Mind, blessed be.